All right, hi everyone. Um, as you mentioned, I'm uh, Craig Kirstein's. I work at Heroku, uh, launched our Python support there, do a variety of product things there. Um, and as you can tell, the talk is how Heroku uses Heroku to build Heroku. Um, so first, I guess, kind of what is Heroku? Um, I assume everyone here has heard of Heroku, Heroku if you came to a talk about it. Um, really, really high level, it's a platform as a service. Um, basically, you take code and you push it to us. You don't have to think about servers. Forget about servers, forget about managing them, security patches, all that sort of thing. It's just done for you. Um, but really, um, Heroku is about developer productivity. Um, that's kind of what we believe is a way of life, that developers should be productive and happy um, and focus on code, not keeping the lights on. Um, as a developer, I'm happiest when I'm building features, not when I'm just keeping a server up. Um, but more than that, it's, um, I like to kind of think of it as, uh, you know, we have 5,000 Heroku apps. Um, we have 500 releases a day, 200 deploys a day, 105 public GitHub repos, 85 people, and 21 teams. Um, so the talk, I'm actually not going to talk about how we run Heroku technically. Um, there's a lot of good blog posts on that. If you search for it on Quora, you'll find that. Um, it's more about how do we work internally on, um, with each other as teams, to, to do this? How do we have, across 85 people, 5,000 apps that we run and manage? Um, these are just internal apps, um, not counting any customers. Um, how do we deploy over 200 times a day new code? Um, and we do this across a lot of really small teams. Um, so hopefully, you know, these are some impressive numbers. Um, if not, I'd love to hear what you're doing, that you're deploying more than this, that you have, you know, more apps per person, that kind of thing. Um, but I like to think we're actually a really efficient engineering team and able to push out a lot of code. So hopefully that's a reason enough for, you know, why does it matter what we do? And then how can you apply this? Um, so coming back a little bit, what is Heroku? Um, I kind of like to think of our platform as a cloud Unix. Um, and what I mean by this, it, it does a lot of things, but we really like the idea in Unix of uh, small, sharp tools. Um, we really embrace this philosophy of uh, an application should do one thing really, really well. It shouldn't try to do 50 things. Um, this is kind of just in our philosophy, but it works really well as we scale out a team and we scale across 5,000 apps, and it lets us be more agile. Um, I mean, a, a basic example of this is, you know, if you look within Unix, um, something really, really basic, you've got alias, which could just have a flag, but instead there's an unalias. Um, why do we have a separate application to do this? Because it's a small, sharp tool that's doing one thing and only one thing. Um, so Heroku is Unix for developers. So how do you apply this, right? Um, yeah, Unix is great, but what's it mean when you're developing for the web or developing desktop applications or anything? Um, so the first is do one thing and do it really, really well. Um, have a straightforward setup. Uh, and a low barrier to entry. And when I say a low barrier to entry, not to getting set up, but to deploying. If it's hard to deploy, it's going to be a mess. So let me kind of dig in on each of these. Uh, the first thing is really small functional apps. Uh, basic example. Um, we have 5,000 apps. Most of these are really li lightweight. Um, many can be, you know, 100 lines of code or less. Um, an example is uh, I've got an application uh, that opens a database connection, runs a query, posts some data, and that's it. That's all it does, and that's an application. Um, we've got, uh, obviously, 5,000 others. We have, you know, applications for, for marketing. So our marketing page is a separate application that's managed separately. Um, our About Us is separate, and it's managed separately. And we've got bigger applications. Um, so, you know, within our billing department, we've probably got 10 to 20 applications that all talk to each other. So uh, with uh, a lot of applications, what I want to do is run it and forget about it. So that one application that I built that, you know, connects to a database, runs a query and posts some data, I never want to think about this again. I can't monitor this on a daily basis. I can't come in and say, did it run? I can't, you know, check on this daily batch job. What I need to do is run and forget it, um, and then alert me when things break. Um, so one thing that we actually do is we have a lot of uh, TVs around the office that just have dashboards on them constantly. Um, we love dashboards because it gives us visibility. So anytime I'm, I'm building something, I'm going to have if it's an important app, I'm going to have a dashboard or some metrics or some alerting around that. So, you know, I'm checking my email regularly. Send me an email when something breaks. Um, and we have a lot of early alerting around this. And it lets us run 5,000 apps without having, you know, a person to monitor 100 of them simultaneously. Um, and a lot of this comes back to, to ownership and that, you know, 
I should be responsible for my app and not have somebody else be responsible for monitoring it. And it also means I'm going to have better code, which means I can, you know, quit fixing things and keep building new features. Um, so straightforward setup. Uh, how many people have started on a project and spent, you know, one week, two weeks getting on board? Um, or you come in, you know, with a new machine and you've got to rebuild everything and it takes, you know, a day or two days to set up. Um, most projects should, you know, be three to five steps to get going. Um, should always have a readme. Uh, basically, for us, if there's not documentation, it doesn't exist. Like the application just doesn't exist. You shouldn't be using it if it's not clearly documented and easy to set up. So um, for us, typically, it should be basically check out the project, install your dependencies, and, and then run it. It should be nothing more than that for any application that you need to build. And then uh, low barrier to entry. So it's great to be able to check it out and run it locally, but at some point I want to, you know, be able to deploy it. Um, for most developers, we want to be able to, uh, to let them hire on, you know, deploy on the first day. Um, so for us, you know, that's Git push Heroku master. Um, but for you, it could easily be, you know, a fabric deploy script. Um, really anything, but you need a, an easy way to deploy and then roll back things. So you don't want to, you know, spend an hour deploying. You don't want to have a long uh, build deploy process, run through QA, and then have someone actually have to go deploy that. It should be a, a one button thing. Otherwise, you're going to spend so long deploying stuff that you're going to have to test it heavily ahead of time. And now you're deploying once a week. And when you're deploying, you're deploying broken things, and then you're fixing those. And it, it just becomes that endless cycle of kind of maintaining software instead of building new features. All right, so that's kind of, you know, how do we uh, approach Unix for developers? What's it mean? Sharp tools, easy to set up, straightforward, um, and easy to deploy. Uh, but how do we actually deploy 200 times a day? Um, how do we have 500 different releases? Um, so the first thing is release early, release often. Um, as soon as a feature is ready, we ship it. Um, we don't wait. Um, we ship code, you know, before there's a full feature. Um, ship incrementally. If things break, that's fine. No software you push and deploy isn't going to have bugs. So trying to make bug-free software uh, is, is just going to leave you in this endless cycle, and you're still going to fix those bugs anyway. Um, so in addition to that, everything we build that's a small app has a defined API or contract. So you know, maybe it's uh, a robust API, maybe it's something really lightweight, but there's some contract that as soon as I deploy something and I have that readme, it's going to work and other developers can expect it to work. I, they don't have to, you know, read through the documentation. They don't have to, you know, monitor for changes. It's always going to work that way. Uh, developer environments, again, you need an easy way to set up. And uh, environment, parity, and it, environment parity, and this is a really, really big one. Uh, your production environment should look like your dev environment, and your dev environment should look like your production environment. Um, and I'll talk a bit about each more of these. Um, so define contract. Um, this can be, you know, really lightweight. Um, so this is, you know, a simple logging tool. So we log, um, uh, this is actually a, a Go application that listens for logs, key equals value. That's what I expect there. And this application is going to parse that. And as long as I put in my logs key equals value, it's going to parse this, aggregate, do something with it. It can be, you know, of course, a RESTful API. If you want, God forbid, a SOAP API. Um, anything, but basically it's some contract you're agreeing to. Um, so developer environments. Um, there's production, staging, but then you also want a development environment, of course. Um, it should be easy to deploy to, and it should look as close to production as possible. And this kind of actually leads into um, the environment parity. So production should look like staging, should look like dev. Um, this lets you, you know, deploy any time. If they look different, then you have to, you know, run through testing on staging once you get done with dev, and usually something, not usually, but often something's different. Um, so and a Django example, if you've got local settings.py, you've got dev settings.py, staging settings, production settings, this is not the same thing. If you're using SQLite locally, SQLite doesn't act the same as Postgres. Um, it, if you try to, you know, enforce a constraint on SQLite of, you know, 50 characters, it's going to go ahead and let you in, insert that 200, and it's just going to be fine. And when you deploy that to production, um, you're going to spend a few minutes, hopefully only a few minutes and not a few hours, filtering through that. Um, so a really good pattern for this is read from environment variables. 
Um, usually when you're deploying to an environment, hopefully you don't have production and staging running on the same box. Um, hopefully they're different boxes and you can basically just say this is my production environment. Um, for us, um, all of these backing services, so persistence, um, is an environment variable. So you should be able to, you know, read my Redis URL, which is just a different one in production and then in staging. And no matter what, I'm going to have a Redis URL in every environment. Um, so 105 public GitHub repos. Uh, but to us, it's actually a little bit more than a code base. Um, but first, let me talk a little bit about kind of how we have so many teams and then come back to, you know, what does public repos mean? Why, um, why do we use Git? What does it mean? Um, and specifically GitHub, because GitHub gives us a lot of power. Um, so 21 teams. Um, a common question is how big is Heroku? We're 85 people, 21 teams. Uh, most people are two to three people in a team. We actually have one team that's the data team that's eight people, um, and it's long overdue to get split up. Um, two to three teams we found is, you know, just that really nice balance uh, for developer productivity, more people working on the same thing. Usually you can split it up into smaller projects so you can move faster. Um, but a, then the common question is, you know, what do you do? Do you, do you use Agile? Do you use Scrum? How do you develop? Um, do you do, you know, waterfall methodologies, plan out long projects? How does this work? Um, it depends on the team. Every team gets to decide what they do. Um, and this results in a little chaos. So, you know, we have, we use GitHub, uh, we use Google Talk for communication, but we also use Skype for communication. Um, we've started using Google Hangout, we use Pivotal Tracker, we use Campfire, we use Trello, we use Basecamp, we use Grove, uh, we use Chatter, um, uh, that's all of them. Um, actually, no, there's probably a few more. So, um, which team uses which tools? Uh, I'm not sure I could even tell you. Um, I, I showed this to uh, another Heroku employee internally, and they said, who uses Basecamp? I had no idea anyone touched it. Um, and it's actually our web apps team that uses it. Um, each team uses their own tools, and then part of this comes back to developer happiness. If you're telling me I have to log into this huge bug tracker and, and rummage through tickets, and it's not the way I want to work, and I want to use you know, GitHub issues, and it's really light, um, yeah, I'm not going to quit tomorrow. But uh, that's going to build over time, and we optimize really for, for developer happiness. Um, so this kind of uh, creates a bit of a problem, of course, in communication. Um, one thing you'll, uh, you'll see here that's pretty common is GitHub issues. Um, and like I said, GitHub uh, really is more than a code base. Um, so GitHub issues we use kind of as a triage in. It's not everyone tracks every issue there, but we've at least got one, one common flow. Um, though I would say it's actually not uh, used throughout the company completely. Um, and, and this kind of comes back to team design. So an important part of this is ownership. So when we use uh, GitHub issues, I exp count that as a handoff, right? Um, as soon as I put something onto somebody else's project because it's in GitHub, I don't have to worry about closing the loop on email. They have the issue. They should be able to, you know, do what they want with it, and I can track back up on it. Um, and so since we allow developers to use whatever they want, they're going to be happier. Um, I'm happy if I get to use my own tools, but I have to be responsible for supporting things. If things break, I'm responsible and I'm on the hook. Uh, so you have this concept of total ownership instead of, you know, handing it off to an ops person. I'm responsible for anything I build. And if that goes down, I should expect to get woken up at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. or 5 a.m. Um, and that happens. So every team, you know, is responsible for carrying a pager for their services. Um, for me, you know, makes it a little bit easier if you work on marketing applications, because usually if they go down, you don't get woken up at 3 a.m., it can wait till 8 a.m. Um, if our billing database or, you know, our main API goes down, they're getting woken up pretty quickly. Um, but it also, you know, improves your quote quality. So making sure that, you know, you have this total ownership. I'm a lot more careful when I push out code and I, I don't have bugs then. Um, so this, you know, broad focus around quality also lets, uh, ensures that engineers have to, you know, have time to, to build things. Um, so this comes back to um, really uh, getting shit done. Uh, meetings are bad for engineers, uh, things they don't need to worry about. So anytime an engineer needs to, you know, offload something, um, it, it's actually funny. Being a little more on the product side at Heroku now, I do whatever the engineers don't want to do. 
It's not I tell the engineers what to do. The engineers tell me what they don't want to do, and that's what I'm stuck doing, so that they can write code. Um, we, there's never um, a time that we have engineers sitting there bored that they can't find something to do. And we have more features than they can build, or we more features than we want them to build than they can actually have time for. So what we want to do, you know, is let them be productive. So the best thing I can do is keep them productive and keep them happy. Um, keeping them happy is actually a really important part. If you lose an engineer, um, hopefully everyone in this room being technical knows that you can't just take a new hire and replace someone old instantly. There's knowledge there, there's a long onboarding process. If you lose someone, you lost a lot more than just a body. You lost, you know, the knowledge in their head, the experience they had on your, your team and your project. Um, and then, you know, of course, agility. So um, a really important concept to us is that engineers are able to try things and fail. Um, if a project doesn't work, we're fine scrapping it. Uh, that can be a, a successful experiment. So a, a failed project, you know, is not a knock against the engineer. And usually this is something we actually really have to, to talk to people about and work with when, they, when we hire them. Because engineers, you know, they don't want to fail. Um, it's this concept of, you know, I failed, it's my fault. And it's, maybe it's not. Maybe the technology wasn't right, it wasn't the right time. Um, a lot of times we, uh, we try to start building something, and if it's too hard, we just table it for six months and come back. And in six months, somehow, it's usually easier. Um, the surrounding technology improves, uh, maybe we've gotten better, all sorts of different things. And then in that six months later, it's easier, we're happier, and it actually works like we expect it to without, you know, spending extra cycles. Um, and this culture of kind of letting engineers experiment, try things, build things, and throw things away if they don't work um, is really about seeing um, over and over talking. So uh, one trick I really like to use with engineers, um, engineers love to build and they love to keep building, keep building and keep building and layering on. Um, and as soon as they, they have something, it's, you know, it's 90% done and there's 10% 10, 10 more. And there's 10% more for the other half of the project. Um, so a really, really nice trick is, is when can I see it? Show me a demo, show me something. I'm really excited about this too. Let me see it. Uh, and it works really well. So we have you know, engineering managers, we have engineers that use this on other engineers. And it's a great, uh, a great way to, to collaborate and show it. Um, and really it gets back to you know, seeing things. If, if the code doesn't exist, if there's not a demo, it, it really just didn't happen. Um, so with all of that, all of the tools, teams don't communicate the same way. Uh, I mentioned we all use GitHub, um, but it is more than a code base. So GitHub issues for us is, is one thing, it's centralized. Um, but it's asynchronous, so I don't have to interrupt it via instant message. Instant message can be bad. Walking over to an engineer's desk is extremely bad. Um, and it hands off ownership. So once I, I put something in a, a GitHub issues, I know somebody else has ownership of it. So I've basically said, here, this is yours. And you know, if they come back to me and say, no, it's not, fine, but that's in their job to do. But it doesn't fix communication alone. So I mentioned you know, we have this, this culture of, of seeing things, of building, of experimenting. Um, one thing around this is uh, we, uh, every Friday, have a, a workshop. Um, and this workshop is you know, one hour. Engineer, basically, there's an open call for times. Think of it kind of like a, a lightning talk internally. Um, and sometimes we have external companies come in. Um, this week we had Twitter, we've had Square, we have other people in, in the Bay Area that are near us working on interesting problems in the same way that we'll go over there and, and do the same for them. Um, but really, it's an opportunity to show what we're working on. Really early stage stuff, not, not a code review, not, uh, hey, this is my final product, here's what I did you know, three months ago and shipped. It's, Here's what I'm working on, and I hacked up in, in six hours today. What do people think? Um, new ideas, and really, this starts to, to bridge some of the gap of what are people working on. We can get leverage then. So if I don't know what another team is working on, we may be working on the exact same thing. Um, workshop, while something very, very simple, uh, is a great way for engineers to you know, get practice communicating, show what they're working on, get feedback. Um, and it doesn't have to be once a week. I'd say this is something that Almost any company that has engineering teams can do. Um, you can start it once a month. You can start it once every two weeks. Um, I would say, you know, for us, we found once a week is really good. And if people don't have stuff, 
that's fine. People don't share stuff. Um, we just cancel it. Um, but it's there every week. People expect it. Um, and it's recorded as well, which is important for people that, you know, are traveling and that kind of thing so they don't get too disconnected. Um, so 85 people. Uh, one really, really important thing is uh, we hire for quality. And we don't compromise on this at all. Um, so, so how do we do that? Um, one important thing is uh, the hiring manager is the same as your manager when you start. Um, you're never going to be handed off to someone else. Um, we, we did this a time or two before, and what we found was, um, for us specifically, there's this process of being indoctrinated into Heroku. Um, the first three months, four months, you feel like you're doing everything wrong because you don't understand the way things work. And it sucks. Um, it's awful. You know, you're being told you're doing things wrong, and it's here you are excited to start a new job. And normally it's exciting, new, you're learning new things, and here you're doing all the things wrong when you thought you, know, you could add value. Um, the reason that that's reset is our hiring process is a little more involved. Um, and not, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of interesting companies doing a lot of interesting things, right? Um, Google's well known for its quizzes, right? Um, for us, we, uh, we have something called a, a starter project. So first you'll go through a normal, you know, send in your resume, send in your GitHub, um, or talk to us. And then we'll do a phone screen, pretty normal. And then we'll do some, you know, in-person interviews. Um, and if all that goes well, we do a starter project. And this is, I think, a really, really key thing to, to Heroku, to making sure we hire quality people. Um, what it is is uh, anywhere from two days to uh, sometimes two weeks, you'll come in and if you want, we'll pay you for consulting. If you want, just, you know, we'll fly to San Francisco for two days, work with us alongside us. Um, if you don't want to worry about setting up the paperwork, um, it's a project. You're working with us for two days, just like you normally would. We'll lay out, hey, here's these three projects. Which of these do you think are interesting? We'll talk through them, we'll work through them. And at the end of it, you know, you'll, you'll give a workshop, basically, saying, hey, here's what I built, here's what I worked on. And uh, that's really, really important for us. I actually went through this process kind of for three months just because I was like back and forth and I was, you know, enjoying other things. And, and then Heroku was eventually like, well, get in or get out. Uh, it's up to you. Usually, you know, it's uh, closer to a two week or two day thing. Um, but at the end of that two day thing, it's, it's clear from both sides. Usually both sides say, hey, no, I, this doesn't work for me. Or both sides say, yeah, I'm really excited about this. Uh, let's get started on the real thing. And so because we have that drawn out process, um, the person that you, know, you sit there and work next to side by side for two days or two weeks and guided you through you know, the hiring process is really important and knows you know, what level you're at. So essentially, you know, if you start and get handed off to someone else, that person doesn't know you. They don't know how you work. They don't know your personality. Um, they don't know what you know about Heroku and what you don't. So you're starting over. You're, you're resetting the clock. So for us, that's really important. When you send in a resume, it's the person you're going to work with, work for, or work with that's reviewing that resume. Um, we screen all the resumes. There's no one else to do it. Um, we have hiring uh, HR people to help with the process. Um, so when you know it comes to flying people out, yeah, someone can absolutely help me fly someone out. But I, I, I want to be the one that's reviewing the resume. You know, if you say, "Hey, I'm applying to Roku," I want to make sure that. I see, you know, if we've had a conversation, I want to make sure I see the resume. I want to make sure, you know, it goes through some HR person that is looking for certain bullets. Um, so hire for quality, but I would say also, um, really explicitly, we hire for culture. Um, this is an important one. A lot of people, um, I think some companies do this, and I think some uh, bigger ones don't always. They say, you know, they're really smart, so we need to hire them. Um, our, our CTO once, you know, interviewed someone and said, all right, they're really great, awesome, they're smart, um, but I kind of don't like them. Like, I don't want to go out for drinks with them, I don't want to hang out with them, um, so what should we do about that? And uh, one of the other co-founders of uh, Heroku said, yeah, um, don't hire them. Like, if you, can't, if you can't hang out with them, if you can't uh, play board games at the office or have a beer or go out for a coffee, like, are you going to be happy working with them constantly? Um, it's like, no. So why would you make yourself more unhappy just to hire someone you know, that you think can push code out the door? Um, at the end of the day, you know, 
We optimize for engineering happiness, and that's really important. So having someone you can work with, um, we're regularly hanging out you know, for drinks, um, hanging out for whatever, movies, that kind of thing, and that's actually really important. So making sure they're a cultural fit, um, all the way from personally, but also to our philosophy on, you know, uh, the Unix philosophy and liking really small, sharp tools. Um, if you like um, building huge Rails applications, you're probably not a fit. Um, Heroku, while it's actually a Ruby shop, um, we have the creator of Sinatra there, and it's, you know, similar to Flask, and we really embrace that philosophy of, you know, small, sharp tools. If you're like, man, I love Rails, I built huge applications in it, and, you know, one Rails project, 100,000 lines, and it's awesome, something's probably not a fit there. Um, so there's other technical things, you know, we like Redis, we like Postgres. Um, if you're really excited about certain other languages, um, maybe it's not a fit. Go's a good one. Go's really exciting internally. Um, and it's not just the language or, you know, that you like Postgres, but it's the philosophies of why do you like it. Um, so digging into that. So not just culturally, but culturally technically too. Uh, another really important thing uh, to, to quality is uh, letting engineers do work. Um, we go back and forth on this. Sometimes, you know, an engineer can work a really focused week. Um, sometimes it, it doesn't happen as much. Um, I know I'm guilty of, you know, too many meetings during the week. Meetings are bad for shipping features. Uh, I know a lot of people think you can design a lot of features in meetings, but you're not going to get any features actually built in a meeting, ever. Um, so one thing that we have is Maker's Day. And this kind of evolved out of uh, Paul Graham's, uh, you know, talking about makers. And this is a really, really important thing for us, and I'd encourage every company ever to try to do something like this. Um, I know Google does 20% time, um, but this is even a little different than that. Uh, it's specifically for getting your shit done. Um, so Maker's Day is no meetings, no interruptions, nothing. Um, I'm guilty of trying to schedule a meeting on a Maker's Day, um, but because engineers know it's a Maker's Day, which is every Thursday, um, they know they can say, no, I'm sorry, it's Maker's Day. Um, a lot of times if you, you know, an engineer needs to get stuff done, but uh, some other person come in, comes in, you know, a CTO comes in or a, a VP comes in or a manager comes in and says, hey, let's schedule this meeting. I know you're busy, but let's schedule this. This is important. A lot of times you're not empowered to say no. Just because, right, they're, they're your boss, maybe. They're paying, making, uh, paying your paycheck. Um, so you don't want to say no to them. It's important, right? They should know what's important. Um, the problem is sometimes they, they don't. They forget about these things. So Maker's Day is a really important thing where they can say no. No meetings, no interruptions, nothing. Um, a lot of people ask, you know, do we do... Um, so when people ask, you know, do we do Scrum? Do we do Agile? Um, some teams do. Some teams we have a, a stand-up once, uh, once a day. Uh, some teams actually email that in. For the teams that uh, email that in, I think they continue that. For the teams that actually stand up in person, uh, they, they don't. They skip it. It's very intentional. No meetings. Get shit done day. Um, and the other big thing is, is quality really doesn't work with deadlines. Um, you, you can't say, this is supposed to be done in two weeks. Let's ship it then. Um, code is, is, is uh, creating a new thing. If you're creating an accounting application that's been built a thousand times, yeah, you can probably estimate when that's going to be done. But for a lot of the things we're building, uh, it's completely new. Hopefully it's completely new, and if not, come talk to me because we're hiring and we're building things that are completely new. If you're building things that are completely new, it's like, it's like any other kind of engineering. It, actually, it's not like any other kind of engineering. It's more of art. It's, it's creative. Um, you work on it and you, you try it and you keep going. Um, this doesn't mean you shouldn't focus on shipping things, but this means, you know, if you're trying to ship something based on an arbitrary deadline, uh, it's, it's crap. And you're going to ship crap. Um, so really we're focused on, you know, when you ship something, it's quality. There's less bugs. Um, and our, our marketing people hate this. What they want to know is, you know, your big release is next week, right? Um, and you can ship that way, but you've got to trim features. You've got to cut things out. You've got to really tail back. Um, or you've got to say, I'm going to ship this when it's ready. For us, we usually err on the side of shipping things when they're ready. Um, so there's a lot of things in there kind of of how we work. Um, 
how can these work for you? Um, I know we're a very unique company. Um, we work differently than a lot. Um, so hopefully let me like recap all of these and highlight the places where you can really take and adapt these and use them. Because um, that's the, kind of the most common thing I hear. So well, that works for you guys, but you're, you're an engineering company building an engineering tool. And it's like, yeah, we are. So you know, I know when I say, you know, engineers, go build something cool, it's probably going to be something that, that works pretty well. Um, if I'm building you know, a, a nursing home application, no, I don't know too much about nursing homes, so I usually need somebody to tell me about that. Um, but there's still a lot of things that you can do to really, I think, build an effective team and steal some of these things. Uh, so I mean, obviously the first thing I think is quality. Um, engineers that care about their craft, uh, that are learning, I think everyone here is a good example of caring about your craft. If you want to punch in at you know, 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock, um, or I guess the hours here may be closer to, to 10 o'clock to, to 7 o'clock. Um, for us, they're not a fit, and I think if you want a really talented engineering company, uh, they're not a fit. Uh, you can find people that, that want to develop awesome things, and you're going to find that quality slip when they're, they're punching in and punching out. Um, and to kind of enforce that quality, if you have ownership, I think this is a big one. Uh, though this varies for some. Some people like handing things to off, uh, off to ops operations and letting them run it. But having that ownership, make sure that you're producing quality. If you own it and it's bad stuff, then your life's gonna suck. Um, if you're getting woken up when things break and people are emailing you and complaining, you're going to fix it, you're going to get better. There's no question about that. Or you're gonna leave and then you'll find somebody else that'll own it and fix it. Um, and I think, you know, for us, a big one is agility. Um, but a lot of these pieces come back into to agility. Um, so kind of how are you agile, releasing early, releasing often. Um, so while I said ship things when they're ready, uh, you can ship incremental things. Um, big features, ship them when they're ready. Don't ship a crappy feature, but ship the incremental things um, so that you're not doing big deploys. Because anytime you deploy something big, there, there's risk. Um, I never run the first release of a new operating system. I never run the first release, especially of a, like a database. I wait till that very next minor version upgrade, and suddenly, hey, all these bugs that everyone encountered when they upgraded because they were excited are fixed. Um, if you do smaller things with software, you can get those fixtures in fixes in faster. Um, envir environment parity is another really big one. Um, if you're de developing in a completely different environment, you're probably creating new bugs for yourself. Um, you can't see what's going on. You're going to be spending extra time on that. So a lot of this, you know, is some things here to save time as a developer so that you can get back to do, you know, more interesting things. Um, but then, you know, keep doing interesting things and do them of high quality. Um, apps that do one thing and do it really well. Um, that's kind of a, a very Heroku thing. Um, I love to see more people doing it, but you know, some people do like bigger applications and it's, it's not the end of the world, but I think you're gonna move slower. Um, but I would say you know, a straightforward setup on any application and a lower barrier to deploy, that's gonna let you deploy faster. Um, and coming back to, to all that, I would say you know, one really big thing is you know, our hiring process is pretty unique, but Maker's Day, workshop, things like that, that let engineers uh, talk, collaborate, and, and really get shit done are, are critical for anyone. So impor implementing those kind of things is, is really helpful to, to productivity and to, uh, to releasing cool things. Um, so that's it. I want to open it up for questions because I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of broad things in there. Hopefully some of those are, are really applicable. Um, if you're curious on how like the Heroku stack works, um, there's actually an answer on Quora. Um, how, how does Heroku work? Uh, that could do as good of a job as anyone explaining actually how our stack works. Um, it's actually taken from a talk from our, our CTO um, that he gave at Pivotal Labs of, you know, end to end, how does Heroku work? Um, and it's about a year old, so some small things have changed, but for the most part, it's about the same. Um, and it gives you a pretty good insight into all the technology there. Um, yeah, and if you're interested in kind of how do we work, productivity things, how do we make engineers effective and happy, um, I blog about some of this, um, and so does um, one of our co-founders. You can find a good bit about it. Of um, He's got a really great post on how he scaled the team, essentially from, you know, uh, eight people and splitting up into to teams and really kind of to where we are now at 85. Um, and then want to open it up for, for any questions.
so the question was how do we actually test for cultural fit? Um, so a big part of, you know, we, we try to test, you know, just by talking to them and phone screens and that kind of thing, but the, the biggest place is really on that starter project when they're out there for a few days. Uh, and what we're doing then is we're, we're going out to dinner, right? Um, we're hanging out, uh, we're having drinks. Um, anytime there's a, a, someone in for a, a starter project, there's pretty much an invite to five to ten people to go out for, for dinner. Um, and that's people you're going to work with um, on teams and people with similar interests and it's just mixed up. So it's not uh, a group of just five people, um, it's a broad group and an open invite. And these are things we're doing regularly, right? As a team we're going out to dinner and if I go to dinner and it's awkward conversation and um, nothing in common and, and they're just kind of sitting there eating their food, then it's not a cultural fit. Um, and it really, you know, if there's a cultural fit with someone there, um, and it's for us, you know, drinking can be a hot topic or, you know, coffee or, or other things. Um, there's been a lot of blog posts about that lately. And, you know, for us, no, you don't have to drink, um, but can you come and hang out? Um, it's not about that, you know, we have board game nights at the office uh, a good bit. Um, do you want to hang around and play board games? Um, any of those things, right? Um, do I like you as a person? Do I want to hang out with you? Um, and it's actually just trying to hang out with them, right? If in two days I'm thinking, all right, glad this person's heading back home, then they're not a fit. Um, if I'm looking to get to, you know, at the end of that, I'd love to have them around next week to hang out again, then they're obviously a fit. Uh, so the question was, how do we handle um, when someone kind of leaves the team, how do we transition the application and, and ownership? Um, so because we have small teams, um, we try to share the knowledge pretty well. Um, fortunately, we've, we've only had a very, very few people leave Heroku. Um, and when they do, it's always been on, on good terms. Um, and there's that, you know, well, one, because things are documented well, um, because you know how to get it set up and running and, and the basics of how it works, hopefully someone should be able to come in and read that. Um, but that's not always the case. Um, so usually, you know, there's some knowledge transfer, part of, you know, total ownership of, I still own that until I hand it off to someone else. So it's my responsibility to, to train someone else, to educate them, um, to make sure they're, they're on board. Um, and usually there's a transition time there, but usually we, we try to train someone up, um, and then there's a very sharp line so it doesn't linger. We essentially say, don't answer questions about this and let this one person come to you. And this one person is the new owner of it, right? So it's, their job is to answer everything first. Um, so we make that transition really, really sharp, which I think helps. So it doesn't linger, it's not hanging around where, you know, for six months no one asked this question, but, um, or I, I kept answering the question and, and a new person didn't know the answer. Um, we make that really, really clear that, and oftentimes there's an email about it. Um, of this person is the new owner, come to them, and, and people do. And that's the best way to kind of ramp up. It's trial by fire, um, it's, it's drinking from a fire hose, but it works pretty well. And hopefully you've transitioned well before then, um, so it's not so bad. Um, but for us, I think the worst thing that you can do is, is transition it very poorly, keep supporting it, and then you actually leave and are unavailable and they can't maintain it. Uh, a lot of time, it's, uh, they have a job they work. So the question was, you know, how do we get people for, for two days into our office, right? Um, first, we have a cool office, um, so that helps. Um, and then food and alcohol. Um, no, but I mean, really, it's kind of a, so a starter project we like to think of as, as dating before you get married. So if you're interested in us, and this is a serious commitment, right, well, let's go on a date. Um, let's get engaged. Let's see how things go. Um, so it's, Hopefully it's, you know, as helpful for you as it is for us. Um, it's really a two-way street. We don't do it just for us to make sure it's a fit. Um, we do it because if you're going to leave your job and, and come work for us, well, hopefully two days is a good test, right? Because um, I'd rather you have that two days and say no than to come full-time just because we give you an offer and you think it's cool 
and then it's, okay, two weeks in, two months in, crap. Now I'm looking for a job again because it didn't work. It wasn't what I thought. Um, so really it's, it is dating before you get married. Um, and that's kind of how we like to approach it. And when people understand that, usually they're pretty open to it. Um, they're pretty happy to do it. Um, it's a juggling act, so you know, if it takes us a month and a half um, to, for you to find two days, a lot of times that's okay. Um, because we care that, you know, we'd rather it work long term than get you in right the door right away just for expediency. Um, being really concerned on quality, we'd rather be shorthanded and have the right people than have enough people, but it, it'd be the wrong fit because it changes our culture. Yeah, it might take a couple of days off. Um, it, it's not uncommon. Um, if they want, we're happy to pay them, you know, as a consultant. Um, the downside of Heroku being owned by Salesforce.com is the contract process so that takes a little while. Um, so usually people are, don't worry about it. I'll, you know, we'll fly them out there, put you up in a hotel. You can see San Francisco a little bit, um, that kind of thing. So hopefully it's an okay trade-off. Um, but I mean, if people want that, we don't want that to really be a blocker for us. Yeah. So we do have remote workers. About a third of us are remote. Um, to be honest, we don't do as well, remote as well as we'd like to. Um, there's some companies that do remote really, really well. Um, think uh, GitHub is a really good remote company. Um, Google's a really good remote company. Um, we do okay at it. Um, about a third of us are remote. And what we found is certain teams do remote first. Um, so within the team, each team operates how they want, right? Um, so if a team wants to have a remote people, uh, then they can hire remote people. And they really start to have a more remote process, right? So they're doing stand-ups and, and meetings on, on Skype and Google Hangout instead of in person. Um, even if they're in the same office, a lot of times they're you know, just doing it that way. Um, so starting there, um, when a team goes remote, usually it's one person if they're super small. If they're a bigger team, try to get two people just so you make sure it's well balanced. Um, Remote people, we try to have them out to the office for events. So when there's a, a holiday party, we, we take the cost of flying them there because it's important to be there. Um, interacting in person is, is very important. Um, we fly them you know, for a week at a time, two weeks at a time. Um, and we get, when teams are remote, we'll fly the whole team there to be together for, when you've got a team that's um, one person for us in, in Texas, one person in Virginia. Um, and then one person in San Francisco. We'll fly, you know, the whole team to a, to a place um, just so that they're able to, to collaborate. Um, and we do this for off-sites as well. So we'll go and, and take a team in the same way and, and have an off-site for, for one week um, somewhere where it's just the team, no interruptions, uh, not expected to communicate with the rest of the company except for, you know, really critical things. Um, so you really get that team cohesion. And then from there as a company, you know, uh, we work essentially really tightly uh, with making sure video's available, um, Skype, um, Google Hangout, those kind of things. Um, we try to work more by email, video, and, and that kind of stuff that really helps for remote people. Um, but I think the important thing is that you have that, take advantage of in-person time, and you have in-person time um, so that you bond and can work well together then. All right, I think uh, last one. How long does our which process? Which process? The recruiting process. How long does it last? Um, it varies. We've hired people in a record. Uh, we've had people from when they applied to when they started, I think, four weeks. That's the fastest. Usually it's pretty slow. Um, usually, you know, we're reviewing resumes, we're talking to people. Um, there's a, it's not a fast process for us. Um, but it can be maybe two weeks or three weeks, just because we've got to have the sort of project, so we've got to coordinate you know, the time to, to get you out there. And I think you know, even if everything goes great really quickly in one week, then we're going to slow down for a week or two, then we're going to get an offer, then we're going to hope that you start. So you know, from the time that you submit a resume to the time that you start, it can be at fastest four weeks, more common is maybe a couple months. Yeah. Sorry, what's that? What board game? Oh, we play a lot of board games. Um, talk to me after. I'll, I'll, grab a, I'll grab a list. There's a lot. 
Um, cool. Uh, thank you, and I'll, I'll hang around if anybody has any more questions. I don't know if I can pull off the hard sell.